colleagues, dear phenomenologists, I'm very pleased to welcome you here in presence in the flesh and for real to the sixth International Symposium on Phenomenological Research in Education. Welcome to you all. Uh, now I want to start with my um, lecture called Title Winning the World. Um, so I just have some theses I want to share with you. There are eight theses. And um, so um, this is the first one. And um, perhaps you notice that we have a lot of crisis we are facing in this year and um, we know that such a gathering is no longer uh, taken for granted in our world and our last symposium in 2019. Uh, in the meantime three years passed and a lot of changes we were um, has to face a whole series of crises has been added to the corona crisis. This is the war in the Ukraine, the climate crisis, then the energy and the resource crisis, some fear of the crisis of democracy, division and polarization of the civil society, the media fuel battles over vaccination, mandatory masks, so-called vac vaccination opponents, and so on. So, the real realities of society and the media have changed as well. Most recently, we have noticed these changes within the universities. Even a reflection and a critical distancing um, begins now with some delay. So in this sceneries of crisis, not only reality appears as a crisis, but uh, also our relation to reality starts to appear uncertain. A crisis of reality is looming. So not reality, but our real relationship to reality is in crisis. This is my first thesis. And um, if you see in our re uh, um, reality, perhaps media and science play a decisive role in this. The crisis of reality as a crisis of relationship to reality thus becomes relevant either as a question of the medium or as a question of the method. I will, I will explain both briefly along the concepts of digitality and evidence. In the field of the media, there are indications for a fundamental change in our relationship to reality. The concept of the digital means the penetration of all life world forms of being and existence and thus the emergence of a new reality of its own kind. Reality is produced by media and technology. To put it pointly, reality is already virtual. So-called natural life world is merely a specific case of a spreading simulation produced by intelligent machines. At the end of my lecture, I will take it up again with Eugen Fink's thoughts on technology and the technical production of images. In the field of science, there has been a long-standing politics of evidence. In the media and in the political announcements, daily figures of incidences, hospital occupancies, contagion have been passed through over and over. Virologists, epidemiologists, demographers, medical professionals dominate the media, media discourse as experts. They are supposed to guarantee evidence, that means objectivity, unambiguity and correctness, and thus legitimize political decisions and that restrict the personal freedom of citizens. In the field of school, 
and university. It is a concept of evidence and excellence that have made an extraordinary career. Evidence-based education promises certainty, objectivity and control over teaching and learning students and teachers. Evidence means here knowledge that works. That is as knowledge about effects as well as causing effects. This does not only promise truth, this is also how reality can be produced. The production of reality in pedagogy happens through the use of international performance tests like PISA, the educational standards through the orientation towards a model of competency, which replaced in Germany the concept of Bildung, as well as through the competitive control through rankings and scores, and through the support of internationally active actors like the OECD. The same can be said, said for the field of university. Where universities are now considered as brands. I was told so by our president now. In Germany, the Excellence Initiative has brought an output and competition-orientated quality management. Success here means high third-party funding, high performance output in the form of publications measured by impact scores and so on, high economic efficiency with consistent effectiveness in performance and output, output orientation, benchmarking, rankings and control mechanisms determine reality of teaching and learning and to put it bluntly, a mania of measurement has arised. The question about the reality of realities implies the questions about the truth of reality. The question about the truth of, of reality, I will show it with Husserl, has been treated in modern times as an epistemological problem of the subject and as a problem of the method of objectivation. Phenomenology, on the other hand, takes the question of reality back to the question of the relation to and in the world. In the following, I will take up the perspective of life world, of horizon, horizon of world, with um, Husserl, Merleau-Ponty, with Heidegger and um, Eugen Fink. And in the last um, uh, part of my lecture, I will uh, focus on learning and on education in a world-centered uh, perspective. Um, the, epistemologi uh, the epistemological question of the truth of reality in the modern conception implies a dualism between subject and object, which methodologically determines reality as a subject cognitive achievement. Husserl's phenomenology, in contrast, strives for a fundamental reorientation. The critical question concerning the condition of the possibility of subject recognition of reality as an external world are wrongly asked in order to be able to, to ask about reality at all, we must already know the external world and reality. In fact, we are already in reality, already in the world, with the things and with the others. They are given to us embodied and originally in the acts of, uh, acts of perception, Husserl says. So the bound of intentionality, interiority and exteriority, immanence and transcendence are already connected. Thus, it is not a matter of how the subject constructs reality, how the outside comes into the inside, how subjective truth can be justified. Instead, it is a matter of how things, in their meanings and reality, in its fullness and its phenomenological quality, show themselves to us as the perceived, the remembered and the judged. Husserl's intentional explication is therefore, on the one hand, the description of the objective, das Gegenständliche, in the modes of experience, in which 
it shows itself and at the same time the analysis of the subject occurrences in terms of the given meaning. Noema noesis. Thus concisely described is the basis of perception of a life world. Why the beingness of the life world thinks is, all, is always only provisional. The world for us possesses a final beingness. This is a quotation. It remains tacitly presupposed as being at all times. Husserl calls this the general thesis of the natural attitude, or more simply, the belief in the world. We are thus familiar with the life world and the things and the people in it. We are connected to the world through the intentional consciousness, through a courtyard of intentions, or in other words, the world announced itself in the horizon. The horizon opened up the area uh, for, from which the objects show themselves. It is only because of this that the things do not appear as backdrops. The people do not appear as puppets. Instead, people have meaning, sense and wholeness for us. And only because of this we can perceive nearness and distance, past and future in their shadows or gradients up shadow. The world as horizon enables us a relation to reality, a relation to the things, to the others, and to the other. Husserl analyzes the crisis of reality as a crisis of the European science and as a crisis of life worldly sensuous experience in his famous Park lectures in the end of the 30s. The approach to and the relationship with reality is being changed in the modern times by a revolution of method, he says. Reality is mathematized by scientific experimental methods and rationalized by philosophical methodological considerations. Ga Galileo consistently applied mathematics to sensory experience. This mathematization of nature, uh, which Husserl says, is based on an idealization of the physical world, uh, world as a mere abstraction. The mathematization of nature thus occurs by means of experiment, uh, experimental methods, by measuring, quantifying, by the in, in introduction of causality and the associated cult calculative possibilities of prognosis, in short, by being evidence-based. The physicalistic uh, objectivism, says Husserl, of Galilei is combined by this Descartes with the transcendental subjectivism. In De Descartes' rationalism, the world is measured more ge ge geometrical. Galileo's objectivism is tied to a psychology of the subject and to a transcendental foundation of truth in the consciousness of the subject. This establishes a dualism which, according to Husserl, defines the modern era between rationalism and empirism, between subject and object, between inside and outside, thing in itself and thing for itself, between subject and world. The sensual uh, uh, abdun, abundance, the life world experienced and experienceable, our everyday life world, um, um, according to Husserl, is devaluated as a secondary, non-objective experience. It is also regarded as the only real, the truly given world through a subordination of the mathematically substructed world of idealities. A methodological fallacy that scientifically colonizes our life world. This theoretical attitude, attitude causes us to take for real something that is actually the product of a historically demonstrable subordination or a dissimulation or a covering up, Verstellung, like um, Heidegger says, or a burying, eine Vergitterung, of the world. 
Husserl says, the dress of ideas make it that we take to be true what is a method. Um, thesis three, the scientific method as objectivation and subjectivation obscures and bars life world experiences. Merleau-Ponty adds a bodily situation, uh, situated character to Husserl's genetic phenomenology. In his main work, Phenomenology of Perception, he continues Husserl's thoughts on the Leib as a zero point of experience and on the world as an horizon. The acquisition of a world, says uh, Merleau-Ponty, happens in a concrete situation. Merleau-Ponty speaks of a being to the world, etre au monde because we are through and through a relation to the world. The human being is just determined relationally. According to Merleau-Ponty, this relationality is constituted by and with the lived body, the world. This is the place where the mind engages itself in a particular physical and historical situation. While mere bodies and objects have a positional speciality, a living body has a situational, situational speciality. The body as a non-thing is not a geometrical space, but it lives in the space and time of the world, he says. Life word turn in pedagogy for a phenomenological pedagogy, the life word approach became of great importance. At the beginning of the 80s, Wilfried Lippitz, whom I want to welcome here in particular, proclaimed a life word turn. Lippitz has presented a series of life word oriented studies on different pedagogical dimensions of meaning and experience. His more recent writing, writings are published under the title Phenomene der Erziehung und Bildung as volume 7 in our series Phenomenological Educational Studies. World as reality to be one. As I already pointed out, the world is not the mere sum of all things, objects, or subjective horizons or perspectives, nor it is a container in which everything takes place. Instead, the world is a universal horizon, like Husserl says. The horizon announces itself in a mundane attitude that goes beyond the life world environment and transcends it. The universal horizon makes the entire field of perception and thus the experience of proximity and distance, future and past possible. But Husserl cannot define this horizon more precisely in terms of its content. For Husserl, it remains an athematic, an empty horizon. Heidegger distances himself from this and goes beyond it. For him, the question of the world is the question of being in the world, of the one and the many, das eine und das viele, like Nietzsche says. Um, in Being and Time, Heidegger presents an ex existential an analysis of Dasein, a fundamental ontology that specifically does not want to be a science of human beings or of philosophical interpretation of life world. Human existence is here defined as being in the world. Man is in the world. He's entangled in the natural, the things, and in the co-world. This inner worldly, he says, situation um, has his world. He stands in it. He is positioned. At the same time, he is an existence. That means he stands out of this existence. He exists because he can understand not only the things in the world, but also his relation to the things and to the world. There's again the relation, the, the, the main thing. Uh, there can be many subjective, cultural or theoretical perspectives on reality and a variety of world views and world perspectives. Yet, all of them are grounded in an existential concept of world. 
in the, like Hatte Heidegger says, worldliness of the world. The world is an existential. The existential enabling of being in the world. Because the human being exists worldly, the world can show itself as a phenomenon. However, the world does not show itself in its self-evidence. It, is, uh, it, is, uh, it shows only itself ein indirectly. Heidegger reduces what is real in the life world to the character of man's existence in the world, to his being in the world. Heidegger's analysis of environment attempts to make the world visible as a phenomenon by interpreting the experience of space and time in the horizon of worldliness. We do not face things in a theoretical or methodological attitude, but we handle with them, we use them. Heidegger calls this things of use Zeug. Schreibzeug, Fahrzeug, Feuerzeug, Spielzeug. Also writing, utensils, vehicles, lighters, toys and so on. In German it's always Zeug. Um, in using these things that we, which constitutes the respective mode of being is revealed. Heidegger calls this Zuhandenheit, in English readiness to hand in contrast to the vorhandenheit, in English, present, at hand, of the natural things. However, the mode of being of these cultural things in action is self-evident to us and thus not obvious. It, is, it only becomes per, uh, perceptible when there is a disturbance in the handling of things in the life world. Um, eine Störung, perhaps. Um, Heidegger calls this um, unzuhandenheit, in English, not readiness to hand. In this unavailability, meaning something not being ready to hand, in the modes uh, of, okay, auffällige, aufdringliche, aufsässige, it's very hard to, uh, to translate, the world, the world makes itself known as a whole. Uh, as the whole of the context of reference of things. Verweisungszusammenhang. If, for example, the pen breaks or the, the computer remains black, the context of reference of things becomes clear to us. The familiarity with them becomes foreign. The context of reference of the world can be experienced as a relation precisely in its withdrawal in its negativity. See this four. The world makes itself known in negative experiences. Heidegger's environmental uh, analysis does not only refer to spatial experience, but also to temporal experience. In the horizon of time as finitude, the world relation can be understood as a felt state of being in the world, Befindlichkeit that expresses itself in moods. Unlike emotions, mood has no correlate, no object. It is not a psychological category of interiority, but precisely the way we are in the whole, we relate to the whole. Mood is therefore an intersubjective relational, re uh, relational category. In moods, the world announces itself as an underlying latent emotional you, as a being in tune, in which the world as a whole is effectively accessible to us. Moods such boredom, fear, joy, sadness can be understood in this way. So, um, in these moods we understand of what appears in the temporality of Dasein. What does mean? What does this perspective on of on life, world, embodiment, and worldliness mean for pedagogy? The central peda the central pedagogical experience is learning. The starting point of this phenomenological inspired thesis is the banal observation that we only learn when we have an experience. This experience cannot be an exclusively subjective one. Otherwise, no experience could be made at all. 
because of its horizontality and worldliness, learning always refers to something else or to someone else. Indeed, learning is always learning something specific and learning from someone specific, from the other. But learning means more than having experiences. Learning is meant to lead to new experiences, to open up to the other and foreign, foreign experiences and to broaden one's horizon of experience, specifically as experience in the world. Learning is, simply put, learning from and in the world, allowing, allowing oneself to be taught by the world and not submitting the world, and opening oneself to what is new and different in the world. Following Husserl, Heidegger and Gadamer, Günther Buck has developed a life word theory of learning as experience. In Germany, his book now is considered as a classic. It has been re-edited um, as a volume nine in the series of phenomenological research and education. Book combines Husserl's theory of experience with Gadamer's language-orientated hermeneutic concept of understanding and relates both to the concept of learning. Both strictly distances himself from psychological objectifying and subjectifying theories, which, which capture learning uh, only as a change in be behavior or as an adaption of structures to an environment. Book, book examines the course of experience as an epagogy from Aristotle. In a genetic perspective, starting with Aristotle, Bacon, Kant, Husserl, Gadamer, and so, and so on. According to book, learning takes place on the basis of an innerworldly horizon-like pre-understanding. The horizon as a pre-understanding or pre-conception is based on life-worldly natural preconceptions. We are already inserted into the world in this way. The preconception is an implicit and is being explicated in the process of learning. The explication leads to a change not only of the horizon, but also of one's preconceptions. There would be no learning process at all if we already learned mere individual things without the horizon of the general. Indeed, we could not even learn the individual or the specific in this way. Learning does not happen as an accumulation of individual data, nor as a network of specific information, nor as a generalization of rules and proceduralization of knowledge. Lear learning rather starts from the general, general and hermeneutically refers to the particular as part of the whole. Learning takes place in relation to the world. Learning as experience is an opening to the world, a broadening of experience and a turn of experience. Learning, however, is not exclusively learning something new, gaining knowledge and skills. Learning as experience, according to book, is rather a change of the whole person, of the field of experience and the structure of experience. In this, the disappointment of anticipation plays an important role as a moment of negativity. With Gadamer in Hegel, books defines neg uh, negation as the negation of a certain expectation that crosses or interrupts an intention and thus introduces a moment of discontinuity or rupture into the continuity of experience. Every disappointment of an expectation is a certain disappointment or with Hegel a certain neg uh, negation. Negative experience is thus conceived differently by book than it is by Heidegger. It is not a disruption of the context of reference in what its worldly readiness to hand. With a negative experience, a disappointment of an expectation in a situation, rather a subjective experience is made about experiences in the horizon of experience, about the expected and about the preconception. This is because the disappointment 
the disappointed expectation not only changes further expectations, but it's changed the preconception itself. So, an experience is made about oneself because the own horizon changes. Learning from this experience is thus, first of all, learning as experience. Learn is relearning, umlernen. It is precisely the negative experience that makes it possible to change old stocks of experience, to reflect on previous opinions and stereotypes, and to open up to new experiences. So, he calls this a process of building, a formative experience. World, or rather the relation to the world, is considered central for series of building and for a pedagogical theory of learning. So, Humboldt did it and uh, actual theories of building do it, do it at will as well. So, building is also seen in the relation between the self and the world. However, in phenomenological theories, the counter-intentional, withdrawal-like and pathetic moments of negativity are uh, more uh, um, are in the center of, uh, of, of the focus. So, winning the world, there is a skipped. This slogan of the phenomenologist relies in only apparent naivety on the givenness of phenomena in the general thesis or on the world belief. Husserl calls this the natural experience or natural attitude. But this natural attitude is dissimulated or obscured, also verstellt or shadowed, verschattet or buried, vergittert, by life word preconceptions, by scientific methods and theories by technology and media. It is hereby formed, normalized and structured. Heidegger puts it in this way. The point of departure of the anal analysis, the access to the phenomenon and the passes through the prevalent covering, coverings must secure their own method. He says it, also der Zugang braucht einen Durchgang. This securing of the method demands a reduction, an epoche. But the world cannot be experienced directly, excess must be won. Merleau Ponty already noted that the complete epoche is an illusion. The bearing of dissimulation of reality and the world cannot be completely dissolved. We have no direct access to reality and the world, but this access can be methodically reduced in the process so that the theoretical and methodological construction of the world, the subjectivation and objectivation are bracketed. In this way, a tentative approach and an opening to the sensual, life worldly fullness and diversity of world experiences become possible. Phenomenology can be described as experience that involves an opening to new experience, an expansion of experience and a transformation. This way, the world shines through the bars and dissimulation of theories, methods and preconceptions. It is mediated immediacy as something that gives itself in a withdrawal but remains fundamentally foreign. Eugen Fink elaborated on this thought in his co cosmological pedagogy. Our relation to reality leads to a world relation in which the world comes into view as a horizon or as a surrounding whole. Eugen Fink radically reposes the question of the phenomenality of phenomena in his sixth Cartesian medi meditation and in his latter works. However, the world is, according to Fink, not only disguised or obscured, but it is elusive. It can only be experienced fragmentarily, negatively. It does not show itself as a phenomenon but in a difference between the inner worldly experiences and of our environment in the present and in the being with 
and the all encompassing the whole. The world is that which gives space and leaves time, at the same time the one and the many. I cannot elaborate this phenomenology of the world and the worldliness at this point. Instead, I would like to briefly take up Fink's philosophy of technology and his phenomenology of image. In doing so, so I will take up the question posed at the beginning about the role of technology, the media and the digital. So far, I have spoken about the modern methodization of the relationship to reality and the world. Now, to con con conclude, I want to talk about the mediatization, or rather the role of technology in relation to reality and the world. What is interesting about Fink is that he does not investigate the media from the point of view of language. Uh, Merleau-Ponty, Derrida, Ricoeur does it in this way. But from the point of view of the image and his functions. Fink worked intensively on the question of Vergegenwärtigung und, uh, und Bild. This is his uh, dissertation in the early 30s and 20s. Perhaps Vergegenwärtigung bringing to mind an image. In the context of phenomenology of the unreal, Fink takes up this approach again almost 50 years later. In the meantime, he has developed a cultural and social phenomenology that combines cosmological and existential perspective into a phenomenology of social practices. Fink describes five basic or fundamental phenomena of human existence and combines them with the philosophy of technology that focus on the Kubernetes trait of modern technology from a cosmological perspective. Fink's philosophy of technology starts with a connection between knowledge or science, technology, economy, politics, following Heidegger's philosophy of technology, but also distancing from him. Using a more current term, one could speak with Foucault of a dispositive. In contrast to Foucault, however, Fink examines relations of being. Those relation in which, relations in which human beings are bound up in relation to the world and to the community. Fink graphs the new dispositive, uh, dispositive of technology, science, economy and human beings with the concept of production. It, it is thus also refers to consciousness. The production has thus detached itself from objects and from the reference to objects, from representation of the things, from the context or from the material. It no longer has a material counterpart, but nevertheless determines our life world to a tremendous degree. On the one hand, it is techni technically instrumental and thus violent to nature, to the others. On the other hand, it is ideological. It is unleashed and, as Fink says, liquidatory. Its functional modes consists precisely in producing a new again and again, in the material as well in the ideas, in a universal global scale. Fink invents the title human technology. For this, in his late writings, he assumes that the doxally life world, self image, and world image, also the Husserlian life world, encompasses all areas of life under the conditions of this um, dispositive of human technology. The, phenomenologic, uh, the phenomenology of the image begins at this point. Images, like technology, are artificial and produce reality. The image is, a real, is as real as the thing it shows. The image indicates an immediate reality in the imaginary world of the image. It consists of both, of the superimposed picture world of the imagin imaginary on the one hand and of the material environment of frames, colors, the hardware, so to speak. 
The imaginary im, äh, Fink sagt, das Imaginäre. Um, both coincidence in the media tally of perception of the image and yet remain per perceptible as a difference. This is why Fink's also speaks of the transparency of the picture world, like a window. It opens up into the real world by allowing the unreal to be real. Within the image, we are not dealing with objects or things that only become visible as depicted images or second level. But in the image, a duplication, a difference can be experienced, or with uh, Bernhard Waldenfels, a pictorial difference, or um, Böhm says, an, an iconic difference. Fink extends this difference to a cosmological difference between the inner worldly material or ontic to say with, with Heidegger, of the and the worldly whole, the cosmic, however, which can be experienced only negatively. It's in it in a withdrawal. So the picture on the one hand represents nothing, and on the other hand, yeah, in, in a withdrawal, it, it shows something, the whole. It manifests in itself in a difference of experience that it's concealed in the image on the one hand and revealed on the other. On the, uh, in other words, the image is an excellent medium of transcendence or transgres transgression of the inner worldly towards the whole. The image, the reference to the world can be experienced. The digital image shows a real unreality, uh, unre uh, uh, a difference in which the world as whole shines through in a world relation. The same applies to technical devices or media that enable a specific pers perspective on the outside and the inside. Fink's ontological, ont ontological or cosmological anal analysis of the image as a medium can thus be extended to digital media and to the aform uh, aforementioned digitality of our life worlds from the perspective of this difference or rapture. The analysis of the image makes it clear that in every image, including the digital one, there is a difference in which the world as a whole shines through and it's in its reference to the world. Through the technical, medial and kubernetic concealments or bearings, something can be experienced even if only negatively through its withdrawal. Conclusion. In relation to reality, the relation to the world becomes apparent. The relation to the world is the critical use of phenomenology against the modern construction and production of reality. The life world and the existence analytical perspective opposes the methodological objectivation and subjectivation of the modern evidence-based approach. The metaphysics of the subject like Heidegger says, and the mathematical idealization of the object. First, by rehabilitation, the fullness and the quality of the pre-predicative and central modes of experience. Second, by the bodily kinesthetic spatiality of the situation, Meloponti, by the referential context in the orientation in space and time of Dasein, Heidegger and by it, uh, identifying learning, experience as relearning, book, and by determining world as cosmological experience in the coexistential practices of Dasein in a negative way, think. With think, it becomes clear, reality does not emerge in, to, uh, in, in opposition to simulation, rather simulation and reality, being and appearance are interconnected in human technical kubernetes. Within the image, however, possibilities arise to keep the relation to the world open in the sense of a difference. A theory of learning, a theory of learning then, would have to think not only about learning as opening to the world or expansion of experience or turning of experience, uh, as indicated above, learning would have to reflect relationship between image and formation. In German, Bild und Bildung. This is strongly connected. 
like Fink's described it. And educating them, this is my last, um, last um, thought, is then can be defined as showing the world both in the analog representations in the image or the book, like Mollenhauer presented in the 80s, uh, but also in the technical digital image, as Fink, Fink undertook it, with his analysis of human technology. Education is then both showing of the world, in which the world shows itself, and in which someone shows the world. That which is shown is not constituted by a del deliberate or intentional practice. It must show itself and it must be able to be shown. The world shows itself in a world relation as a phenomenon and at the same time it hides itself. Seen in this way, the intentionality of educating or education is based on the passivity of what can be shown in showing. Without this something of the world, nothing could be shown. Showing is based on an acquisition or on a winning of the world and requires a devotion or a sur surrender. Jean-Luc Marion uh, said this. A surrender of the subject to what is given in the world. This includes the vulnerability of the person who is showing and the passivity of uh, letting oneself to be shown and the negativity of what cannot be shown. Thank you very much. <laughs>